Looking Back to Look Forward is a project um, by Mid and East Antrim Borough Council's Museum and Heritage Service. Uh, we have three museums across the borough in Balmina, Carrick, Fergus and Larne. Um, we wanted to show what life was like over the last 100 years using some of the objects in our collections. We've used a number of broad themes such as health, uh, welfare, education, the Second World War and popular culture to show off our collections within an exhibition this year and also for these short reminiscence videos. Uh, my name's Elaine, I work with the Museum and Heritage Service and we're delighted to be partnering with Midden East Antrim Agewell Partnership for these short recorded reminiscence videos. We hope that these objects will inspire you to have a chat with family or friends or you may even remember some of your childhood memories or working life memories by seeing some of the objects. So for this session we're looking at school days and childhood. Um, so some people say that school days were the best days of your lives so you can decide whether you agree or disagree with that. Um, one thing that you mightn't have been too fond of would have been your times tables. So we have some table books um, in the collection, um, very neatly written out tables, which people would have had to have learned off um, at primary school. So you may still remember some of these or you may not. This small jotter is from um, Balmina Model School and it was used for um, arithmetic and drawings. So you can see some of the, the drawings here. So it was a very general um, jotter that somebody would have used for their schoolwork. They've also used it for arithmetic. And you can see there the red ticks from the teacher. Um, so this person has got all of those correct. Another part of school life, and you may be familiar with these books, was the, the Fear of Oster's um, copy books. And this was for your handwriting. So in these books, you would have had an example of handwriting and then you would have copied it um, in below. And in those days, the teachers probably were quite strict about your, your handwriting pre-computer. You might have used pencil, but you also might have used a, a fountain pen. And we have some of the, the ink for pens here. Uh, this could have been very messy at times. Um, we eventually moved into small refills for fountain pens, but you might also have had blotting paper. Um, if the ink spilled, it would have been um, particularly messy for your, your handwriting. So uh, we have these things in the collection which relate um, to early school days. In our collection at Mid-Antrim Museum, we have a lovely collection of school books and jotters from Tully Grawley Primary School. Um, it was near Cullibaki and the headmaster there was Mr. Russell. Uh, the pupils made these lovely um, books with poems and pictures um, from the really inspired by nature and their um, teacher from the area. So a lot of them reflect the seasons. So they've uh, written poems about spring, summer, autumn and winter, also traveling to school, their journeys to school and activities uh, that they would have taken part in. Um, so particularly inspired by nature, there's lots of pictures of flowers, um, lots of pictures of rivers, animals. The front covers of these are actually made from um, prints from lino cuts, which the pupils also learn to do at school. And this is a lovely collection that really reflects uh, their school days. Hello there, uh, my name is Colin Irwin from Glenarm in County Antrim and uh, I've been asked to come along today and uh, sing a wee song or two, tell you a wee story or two and have a wee talk about uh, days past. And I, I think I want to, to start about school days and I'm going to sing a wee song that I learned when I was at school which was not the day or yesterday as they say. It's a wee song called It'll Tell Me Ma and I'm sure you'll know it and if you do you can sing along. Tell me, Ma, when I go home, the boys won't leave the girls alone. Pull my hair and the stole my comb, but that's all right till I go home. She is handsome, she is pretty, she is the belle of Belfast City. She is a court in one, two, three, please won't you tell me who is she? Albert Minnie says he loves her all the boys are fighting for. Knock at the door and they ring at the bell saying, Oh my true love, are you well? Out she comes as white as snow, rings on her fingers and bells on her toes. I'll Johnny Morris, he says she'll die if she doesn't get the fellow with the roving eye. Tell me, Ma, when I go home, the boys won't leave the girls alone. 
Pull my hair, they stole my comb, but that's all right till I go home. She is handsome, she is pretty, she is the belle of Belfast City. She is a court in one, two, three. Please, would you tell me who is she? Let the wind and the rain and the hail blow high, let the wind come travelling through the sky. She's as nice as apple pie, she'll get her own lot by and by. When she gets a lot of her own, she won't tell her ma when she comes home. Let them all come as they will, birds Albert Mooney she loves still. Tell me ma when I go home, the boys won't leave the girls alone. Pull my hair, they stole my comb, but that's all right till I go home. She is handsome, she is pretty, she is the belle of Belfast City. She is a court in one, two, three. Please, would you tell me who is she? And I learned that um, probably nearly 50 years ago. And uh, like a lot of things we uh, learn in those early days at school, it kind of sticks in your head, doesn't it? You remember it. And, uh, well, of course, you remember all th kinds of things about school, but probably the thing you remember most are the teachers. And you remember whether they were good teachers or whether they were bad teachers. They're the ones that stick in your head, aren't they? The ones that were lovely and kind and generous and good teachers. But also the ones who were maybe a wee bit more, um, how shall we say, uh, cruel. And there were plenty of those too. I'm sure you've all got your, you've all got your stories there. Um, and of course, back years ago, um, people left school when they were 13 or 14 years of age. I know my parents, that was, the, that was the school leaving age when they were at school. My mother left when she was 14. My father stayed on for another couple of years. He was lucky. He went to, he went to a bit of a, a, an art college after, after school. But of course, that was during the Second World War, and that's a, that's a whole other story for another day, probably. But, um, uh, and so if you left school at 14, well, you were maybe only at school for seven or eight years because people didn't start school until they were six or seven years of age uh, in, in those days. And some of you may remember uh, going, to, going to school uh, like that. Of course, nowadays you can't leave school until you're 16 years of age. Things have changed greatly. and Most children stay on until they're 18, don't they? And most young people nowadays, of course, go off to university. It's nearly, nearly uh, more people go to university than don't uh, nowadays. But as we said, back, uh, back years ago, 14 years of age was, uh, was the age that you left, left school. And, um, well... A man told me a great story uh, that I want to tell you. Uh, he told me about all kinds of things. Uh, he, was, he was an old man. He was at school during the 1930s, the late 20s and the 1930s. And uh, he was left-handed. And in those days, uh, uh, the, 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 a lot of teachers thought that being left-handed was a slovenly way to write and it made a mess of your exercise books and so on. And so they, some teachers were very loath to let children use their left hand. And this poor, the poor, uh, this poor uh, young fella, as he was then, he, of course, when you went to these rural schools, you were there for seven or eight years, and so you had the same teacher usually for that whole period of time. Well, the whole time he was there, he wasn't allowed to write with his left hand. He had to write with his right hand, which is not easy if you're left-handed, of course. But any time he was caught with a, a piece of chalk or a pencil or a pen in his right hand, he got a severe rap over the knuckles and he soon learned. And he was, as an older man, when I met him, he was, he was a very aged man, he was well into his 70s, and he could write equally well with his left hand uh, or, or with his or, or with his right, and in fact, it was a wee sort of a party piece with him because because of all those years he got those wraps over the knuckle. He just always can. He just continued on to use his uh, right hand, and he, he wrote and he wrote his letters and he signed his name with his right hand. But then he could take the pen and he could write equally well, uh, if not better, with his left hand and sign his name exactly the same with his left hand. Of course, nowadays that would be considered to be a 
very cruel thing to do, you wouldn't you wouldn't get away with that nowadays. And I'm I'm sure you've all got memories of um, teachers using the strap or the cane back in the days. Even when I was at school, of course, that was a that was common practice. Nowadays, children would be horrified uh, if you told them that kind of thing, wouldn't they? And so uh, we we remember those we we injustices, don't we? That way that we experienced when we were at school. And uh, as I said earlier, we remember the good teachers and the bad teachers. And I want to tell you one, a story that another old fella told me about a teacher when he was at school. You see, in these wee rural country schools, um, very often the teacher was there for years and years, of, as we've said. And so you got the same teacher all the way through your school and up to you were 14 and, and you left. And uh, in those uh, country schools, of course, the teacher probably lived beside the school or lived in the village or very nearby anyway. And that was the case with this wee country school. The, the, the master, as they called them in them days, he lived next door to the school. And the children came along every day and he would have the, the school opened up. And in the winter time, of course, the children all had to bring a piece of coal every day or a peat for the fire. And that kept the, kept the school room warm for the, for the whole of the day. Some of you might remember that, depending on where you went to school. But this teacher, he was married and he had children of his own. Um, he had a son at the school and uh, his son was a, a clever fellow, uh, like his father was a two, of course. And the son um, sat up at the front underneath uh, the big high desk where his father sat because his father always wanted to keep an eye on him, make sure he was progressing in the way that his father wanted him to do. You see, because his father had uh, high hopes for his son. He wanted him to maybe go off to college in Belfast and, and maybe even become a teacher or a lecturer at Queen's University. You see, that's what he would really have liked to have done. He didn't want to be in a wee country school teaching numbskulls, as he called them. But anyway... He had his son sitting up there and right enough, he was a clever fella. And no matter what exercises were set, his son always came top of the class. And no matter what questions were asked, his son's hand was always first up in the air. But of course, he was at the top end of the, the school. Down at the bottom end of the school, there's always at least one. And there was always a wee boy, and he was usually called Huey wasn't he? We Hugh. There's always one of them in every class. I know there was when I was at school. And in this particular school, in this class, there was a wee Huey. And he was the youngest member of his family, a big family. And everything was handed down to him. And there was patches on his patches and the sleeve of his coat was down to here and his nose was always tripping him. And we Huey, God love him, he wasn't the brightest star in the sky. And the master made wee Huey sit up on the desk beside his son. And so you had the two levels of the school sitting side by side in the wee double desk right in front of the master. Well, one day, one Monday morning, the master come in and he, of course he had all the jotters from the weekend. You remember the old jotters that you used to get in that old thick paper that you used to write in and uh, you had to have them backed by uh, wallpaper was a good one. Some, some, some children had their books backed by brown paper or something like that uh, but, but in our house it was always wallpaper. Do you remember that? Some people, I remember even some people coming with their books backed by newspaper. Do you remember that? But anyway, he had all these big pile of jotters, some of them a wee bit on the dog-eared side, a wee bit ink splattered, but uh, he had all the homework to check that he'd given the children on the Friday. And so on the Monday morning, which he'd done nearly every Monday morning, he told the children that he was going to give them a composition. Do you remember writing the compositions? 200 words, 500 words, or maybe if you were unlucky, a thousand word comp composition. Sometimes you would have got that for punishment. But anyway, this morning he gave them a composition to do and he told them that he wanted them to write a couple of hundred words on the robin. You know the robin redbreast, one of our most favourite wee garden birds. And of course the children set to. 
and the master got the big pile of jotters and he took the top one and he was going down through and he was ticking and he was putting big X's and underlining and writing comments in the jotters as he as he as was his want. And every now and again he would look up over his glasses and he would look around the class and he would see some of the children were concentrating and writing away and some of the children were chewing on their pencil and looking out the window. And there was wee Huey in the front beside his son who was studiously writing away. And wee Huey was chewing his nail and he was looking all over the place and he was looking out the window. Everything, looking at everything and then thinking about everything other than what he should have been. Well, the master let a gulder out of him. Huey McLaughlin, what are you doing, boy? What's that, sir? What are you doing? I I'm thinking, sir. Well, think a bit quicker and a bit harder and put that pencil to paper. Yes, sir. Well, this happened a few times. Every now and again, the master would look up over his glasses and wee Huey would be chewing his nail. The teacher would let a gulder at him. Well, eventually the master began to lose his patience and he said, McLaughlin, put that pencil to paper and get that composition finished or I will keep you in after school today, boy. Well, he didn't mind much, but he didn't like staying in school any longer than he had to. And so the next time the master looked up and scanned around the classroom over the top of his glasses, Huey was working away. He was looking over the master's son's shoulder and writing down everything that he's seen, a couple of words, and then he would look over and he would write a few more words. And he kept doing this. Well, the master couldn't hardly contain a wee smirk on his face. And he let another gulder out of him. McLaughlin! Yes, sir. What are you doing, boy? I'm writing, sir. Good man. Carry on. And the next time he looked up, again, McLaughlin was copying every word that he seen over the master's son's shoulder. Well then, eventually, the master let another shout out of him. McLaughlin, what are you doing, boy? I'm writing, sir. Are you copying, McLaughlin? No, sir. Good man. Lift your jotter up there, McLaughlin, if you wouldn't mind, and take yourself down to the back of the classroom. We Huey lifted his jotter and his pencil and he went down to the back of the classroom and he sat in a vacant desk. Well, soon the hour was up and um, the master called time on the composition. Children, put down your pens and your pencils. Time is up. And then he said, who would like to read out their composition? Of course, the master's son, Han, was straight up in the air first. No, 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 he said. I think we'll let some of the other children have a chance. Huey, McLaughlin. Huey was sitting with his head among his feet, chewing his nail. What's that, sir? Stand up, Huey. What, sir? Stand up, Huey. Huey stood up. Lift up your jotter there, please, if you wouldn't mind. And regale us with uh, what you know about the robin. What's that, sir? Tell us what you've written, Huey. We Huey started to read. The robin is a passerine, a perching bird. It is a member of the ch chat family and it sings all spring and summer, but also in autumn and winter too. It is one of the few songsters that sing at this time of the year. And then Huey started to stumble and stutter. What's the matter with you, McLaughlin? Nothing, sir. Well, continue on, please. And then we Huey said, And the robin is a wee round dumpy bird with a big fat red belly, and it has a wee short neb a beak. And my mother always says, if one flies down the chimney, it's wild bad luck. You see, that teacher couldn't resist the temptation to make himself look very clever, even at the expense of poor wee Huey. 
And that's a story that is told to me as being true. Today's topic is holidays and days out. So you may remember as a child going for a day out, whether, whether that was on a school trip or a Sunday school trip. Uh, you might have travelled by train and you might have gone to the coast or the beach. So a lot of places locally like uh, Port Rush, Carnlock, Newcastle, uh, Warren Point or even Donegal um, to the beaches uh, for a day trip there. Um, you might have gone on a work trip uh, in employment with some of your work colleagues on a, on a day out and you might have gone again locally. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that air travel and some of the, the destinations like Spain uh, became more popular. So uh, again, people traveled further afield um, after that. But people um, still are very fond of going to the beach, uh, especially in the last couple of years. We've been staying closer to home and making uh, use of the beaches and uh, beauty spots that we have on our doorstep. This uh, small photograph shows some people at Carnlock Beach. Uh, and you can see there that they're enjoying good weather and that they're in the sea. So you may remember your first time uh, paddling in the sea or going for a swim in the sea. And probably if it was here, it would have been very uh, cold. Uh, in terms of what you would have worn, uh, some people wore swimming caps uh, like this one. Uh, these became very popular in the 50s and 60s to keep uh, longer hair uh, drier in the pool. Sometimes um, they were decorated with floral um, designs and patterns as well and they were made out of synthetic material. So, so this one here um, was used uh, for swimming. When you went to the beach, um, you might have bought one of these or taken one of these with you. Um, so this is a bucket and spade set, but this is actually um, a very early one because it's tin rather than plastic. Uh, and it comes with the, the spade as well. These were made um, for days out and they were made with very um, decorative colors um, on them so that um, they were nice and bright for, for younger people who were using them. When I was young, most people didn't really go on holidays, not the way we think of holidays today. They didn't go for two weeks in the sun back in those days. People couldn't have, uh, have afforded it, I suppose. And um, there was no such thing as package holidays. They really only came about in the, in the 1970s, I suppose. But uh, around, around this area, the area is so beautiful and with so many beaches, you know, we have Browns Bay and Ferris Bay over in Island McGee, we have Sandy Bay, Ballygally, Drains Bay, and then you come up the glens, you have Glenarm, uh, Carnla, Cushendaw, all those wee towns all have their own wee sandy beaches, some better than others, of course. And then as you go on up round the coast, you have all kinds of places. You know, you have away up on the north coast, you have Benone Strand, beautiful beach, seven miles long, uh, I, I think it is, something like that. And you have white rocks there at Port Rush and Port Stewart. And, and so people that I knew anyway, and I'm sure you, you've, all, you've all done this yourselves, had day trips away. And people would go to what they talked about, the port, they would head up to Port Rush and, and Port Rush had everything that people needed in those days. It had it was like a wee mini Blackpool. It had the amusements. It had the lovely beaches and people were content to play with their wee buckets and spades and, and have a have a dip in the in the sea. And so that that was what people did on their holidays. Your holidays was your was your two weeks in July, the, the July fortnight as they talked about. And then, of course, there was a, a week in September. And then people went to all kinds of fairs as well. There was a, the May Fair in, in Ballyclare and the Lammas Fair in Ballycastle. And people come from all over the countryside, as they still do, to that fair. And um, so pe people, pe people holidayed, you know, one day at a time. And... Uh, I, I, I know that I have, and I know that most people will have very fond memories of a favourite place that they, that they went to, like, uh, like, like Port, Port Stewart Strand or, or um, some of these favourite beaches around the glens of Antrim where they maybe spayed, spent a day or maybe they, maybe they went and stayed in a caravan for the weekend, something like that, because of course there are lots of caravan 
uh, parks all up through the glens. They're very high tech nowadays, but e even even back in the 1960s and 70s, people came there to stay for a, for a weekend or something. And so people back then, that, that was, that is their holiday memories, isn't it? Ice cream and candy floss and yellow man and dulse and I suppose maybe a wee bit of rainy weather as well. It wasn't always uh, nice and sunny, sure it wasn't. But anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing you a wee song which is entitled White Park Bay. White Park Bay is my favourite bay of all the bays all up around the coast. And uh, it's, a, it's about, um, well, I'll, I'll sing the song and you'll, you'll get what it's about. Um, it's about uh, a fella looking back on one of his very fond memories uh, from whenever he was young and taking a day trip out to White Park Bay. I wrote this wee song uh, a few years ago now and um, it's called White Park Bay as, as I think I already told you. Here we go. Hope you like it. Those burning summer days we spent at White Park Bay smolder in my memory. Backseat of the bus, two lovebirds they called us, and the driver let us go for free. Troubles left behind, your hand holding mine. You let me down, Sunday pan. Jump the farmer's fence, pitch your brother's tent, head out in the maroon grass. You play the guitar, I play the clown We didn't mind when the summer rain came pouring down Old be young Old be young Old be young So in love always cold and I was on the door but sure young love dances on a whim It's dangerous I said you laughed and shook your head I knew I'd have to sink or swim French baguettes, smoked and rolled cigarettes, drank paper cups and sparkling wine. Lay there in the dunes, beneath that August moon, you asked if it was my first time. You play guitar, I play the clown I didn't notice the leaves were turning slowly brown Oh, to be young Oh, to be young Oh, to be young and so in love I suppose it was naive to ask you not to leave 
I thought I might have been the one When you said it was good crack I held my tears back My heart felt like it weighed a ton Call me once or twice Know to hear your voice Took some of the pain away My glimmer of a hope All went up in smoke When I heard about your fiancé You play guitar, I play the clown I didn't care if the whole damn world turned upside down Oh, to be young Oh, to be young Oh, to be young and so in Today the, the topic that we're looking at is work and life. So there are quite a lot of employers within uh, what's now the Mid and East Antrim uh, Borough area. Um, for this project that we did a few years ago with Me Up, um, we've used this picture here of Clinger's uh, employees uh, in the 1960s. So that was one of the places locally um, that you could work. A lot of people before that maybe worked in the Braidwater Spinning Company or the Phoenix Weaving Factory and there was actually a number of other employers such as Gallagher's Michelin in Ballymena, also Court Halls and Carreras in Carrickfergus and the Turbine Factory in Larne. So there was a lot of big multinational employers um, that came to the area in the 1960s. There were also lots of people employed in jobs such as seamstresses, uh, jobs that maybe aren't so common now, um, for example, in laundries and shirt factories as well. Uh, one thing that uh, was very prevalent in the 50s and 60s was that a lot of people made really good friends at work and there was a lot of social and recreation clubs associated with factories and businesses and that people could be involved in. So, for example, there was lots of sports clubs and this is a, a darts trophy from um, the Gallagher's factory. So people were involved in various um, sports such as football, darts and competed um, within the factory. Also, uh, in the Braidwater Spinning Mill, there was an Irish dancing um, team and there were various um, events such as beauty queen dances and this is one from the 1950s as well. Uh, Gallagher's produced these little uh, magazines for their employees called smoke rings and as some of the um, industries over the years um, have produced books related to their, their history so this one in particular relating to Michelin. Of course as we said earlier if you, if you left school at 14 a lot of young lads went into uh, the trade of their fathers or they had apprenticeships or they just went into farm labouring or maybe building labouring or something like that. But even before we got there, of course, many of us had part-time jobs. I wonder how many of you had a, had a wee part-time job before you actually went into the, the big world, as it were. I know, I know uh, when I was a young lad, everybody had part-time jobs. There were, there were paper rounds and I had one of them for a while, uh, a short while myself, uh, the Belfast Telegraph. Do you remember that? The big, the big bags. And, they, and we were only wee lads, 13 and 14 years of age. And some of those bags that we had strapped over, you could hardly carry them. And um, we had, we, you know, you maybe had a, a, maybe took you a couple or three hours to do your paper round which was great if it was a nice dry evening, but if it was teeming out of the heavens, it was a, it was a torture. But uh, the one I liked the best was the, the Saturday night round. Do you remember that old paper, the, uh, the, uh, the Saturday night? I don't think they do it anymore at all. But I used to, I, I, was, I lived in Larne at that time, and uh, 
There was loads of pubs. There might, there might have been 14 or 15 pubs in the town at that time. And you went round all the pubs with, the, with a bag full of the Saturday night. And of course, all them old boys had their, their, their working week over them. And they were in good form and they'd had a, a drink or two. And they were very generous. And that's when you got your best tips. And I didn't mind so much uh, uh, that, that doing the Saturday night. But a lot of the young lads that I, uh, I uh, sort of ran around with, a lot of them had a milk run. Do you remember the milk floats with the reel at the back and the, the milk boys, maybe four or five of them on the back of a milk float, holding on for grim death as they stood in this? And they thought it was great fun. And I always thought it looked great, great fun. <coughs> but my mother thought it was far too dangerous uh, for young lads to be, to be hanging off the back of those milk floats. And again, it would have been all right in the summer months, especially in the summer holidays, when it was daylight and nice and warm. But in those winter months, I remember uh, mornings of snow and ice and rain and wind and boys coming into school and they were, as my mother would have said, punctured. They were that tired for they'd been up from five o'clock in the morning and then they were coming into school to do their, do their day schooling. Well then, of course, then there was uh, the, the, the hotels. There was lots of hotels and things around Larne and up and down the countryside at that time as well. And of course, if you were, if you were uh, 15 or 16, you could maybe get into one of the hotels, which was a great job. Long hours and, and uh, very unsociable hours. But of course, when you're 15 or 16, you don't think it that way, that uh, uh, you're working Friday and Saturday night. And of course, usually all day on a Sunday. For in them days, the pubs were all closed, you remember? And the only place that you could get a drink was uh, a hotel. And I worked in the Drum Nagria Hotel near Glen Arm here. And uh, it was open all day on a Sunday. And people came from all arts and parts all around Glen Arm and Drum Nagria and Carn Castle and Larne and Palamina to get a drink in the Drum Nagria on a Sunday and it was full of farmers and crack and I, I just loved it and heard some great yarns and great stories back in them days. But then of course once you get a wee bit older you're, uh, you're not just quite so fond of the, of the, uh, of the work on the Friday nights and the Saturday nights and the Sundays and you maybe wanted to go to a, a dance or something but that's uh, another story. We'll maybe come on to that a wee bit later. But of course Back years ago, and some of you might know what I'm talking about, some of you might even have experienced this, a lot of people from Ireland, from all over Ireland, had to go to England or Scotland to look for work because there wasn't enough work here in, in, uh, in the north of Ireland for, for everyone. There was plenty of, of uh, industry and so on, and, uh, and the shipyard and so on. But if you came from up in North Antrim or somewhere like that, there wasn't just so much work. And... Uh, uh, people migrated, as they still do to this day, of course, but back in those days, there was hundreds, thousands of people went across the water. And I want to tell you about a story about one man, a boy called Jack. Jack was a gardener, and he could get no work at all here in the north of Ireland, and he headed across the water to, in search of work and eventually he came to this big estate, a big stately home owned by an, a rich English nobleman. Well Jack heard word of this job and he applied for it and the nobleman interviewed Jack himself and he answered all the questions and the job was his for the taking except he had to swear an oath to this nobleman that he would um, not gamble ever. You see, the nobleman believed that gambling was the root to all evil. It led to all kinds of, of drinking and bad habits and keeping bad company. And he didn't want any of his employees to be behaving in that manner. So to get the job, Jack had to swear an oath that he would never, ever gamble. Well, Jack worked away for many years without incident. But then one day he was sent for by the big house and you didn't very often get sent for. And when he arrived in, the Lord was sitting in his study. Come in, Jack. Jack came in. He took off his cap. Yes, my Lord. 
Jack, he said, it has come to my attention that you have been gambling. Me, my lord? Yes, Jack, you. My lord, I have not. Jack, there is no use in denying it. Another member of staff has come forward. Please, don't stand there and lie to me. My lord, I would like to know who this telltale tip is. I have been doing no such thing, Jack. I can bring my informant out to bear witness against you if you like. I wish you would, my lord. Well, the lord summoned his informant. The gentleman came out. He was another member of staff, as the lord had said. And he said that he could prove that Jack had been gambling. How so? said the Lord. Well, the other member of staff went up to Jack. He reached into Jack's waistcoat pocket and he took out a deck of playing cards. There you are, my Lord. There's the proof you need there. Dear, 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 said the nobleman. How disappointing, Jack. Not only have you broken your oath to me, but you stand there, your employees, for so many years and lie to my face. I am not, my lord, said Jack. I don't use those cards for gambling. I use those cards as an almanac. <laughs> an almanac, said the lord. How so, Jack? Well, my lord, there are four suits and a deck of playing cards, one for every season, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And there are 13 cards in every suit, one for each week of the quarter. And there are 52 cards in the deck, one for every week of the year, 365 spots on the cards, one for every day of the year, and one left over for a leap year. Very clever, Jack, said the uh, the nobleman, but you don't expect me to believe that nonsense, do you? Well, Jack pulled himself up to his full height and he said, My lord, I am not an educated man. I can neither read nor write. But on my oath, I have never used those cards for gambling. I use them as an almanac and to remind me of my Christian duty. <laughs> Your Christian duty, said the Lord. How so, Jack? Well, my Lord, may I have the cards? And he took them. And he found them out. And he held them up to the Lord. He says, pick a card, my Lord. Anyone at random. Well, the Lord picked a card and he held it up to Jack. It was the four of hearts. The four of hearts, my Lord. That reminds me on the other four great religions of the world, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Mohammedism. And that I, as a Christian, must love my fellow man, no matter what his creed or beliefs. He found the cards out again. Pick another one, my Lord. This time the nobleman picked the 10 of diamonds. Ah. The Ten of Diamonds, my Lord, that reminds me on the Ten Commandments and how hard, hard they are to keep. Well, he could see that the nobleman was impressed, but not entirely convinced. And the nobleman took the cards from Jack. Let's see how clever you are, Jack. And he went through them one by one, but Jack never missed a beat. He talked about the one true God, the two Testaments of the Bible, the three persons of the Holy Trinity, the four Gospels, the five wounds of Christ on the cross, the six days that it took God to make the earth, the seven deadly sins, the eight beatitudes, the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, and the ten tribes of Israel. Well, the old fellow was impressed by this stage, but he was a bit of a scholar too, you see him. He just wanted to be sure. What about the face cards, Jack? What do they bring to mind? And he picked one at random. It was the Jack of Spades. 
Ah, my Lord, Jack of Spades, that reminds me on myself and that I am but a humble gardener. He picked another one. This time it was the Queen of Clubs. Ah, my Lord, that reminds me on our good Queen Victoria in her morning clothes. May God bless her and ease her pain. And then he picked at last another card. This time it was the King of Hearts. And Jack said, my Lord, the King of Hearts, that reminds me on your good self. And how generous and loving you are to us, your humble servants. Well, that clinched it for the nobleman. There and then he decreed that the telltale tit be dismissed. Jack was given a promotion to head gardener and a pay rise. But that's not the end of the story. You see, if the nobleman had just thought to ask Jack about the joker, well, Jack probably would have told him that the joker reminded him on the devil and all his evil works. But as it was, the joker was tucked up in Jack's top pocket along with a set of dice. This session we're looking at uh, dance halls and ballrooms. So one of the most famous ones, um, well-known ones locally, was the Flamingo in Balmina. Uh, you might also remember the Rinca or going to the Floral Hall or different um, dance halls where you grew up. Uh, the Flamingo opened in 1960 and uh, it was known for attracting a number of well-known um, singers and bands such as the Rolling Stones, Roy Orbison, Dusty Springfield and Tom Jones. There was also a number of local um, show bands that played there as well and also as you can see from these posters uh, country and western music was very popular as well. Each week um, there were small programmes produced so you could see the price of entry and also uh, the people who would be playing at that particular week. And as well, something that was very popular, um, the Flamingo was uh, a milk bar. So um, again, there was no alcohol there. Sometimes they advertised on their programs that jeans and denim wasn't allowed. Um, something that was very popular with young people at the time was to go for ice cream and refreshments and meet their friends as well. So this is a, a menu from Caulfield's um, ice cream uh, parlour. So you can see here um, the menu. So there was a wide variety of ice creams and uh, chips with uh, almost anything that you could get there. You can see the prices as well. So you may remember um, in terms of the old money what that would have been. Um, and you may remember going out with friends and enjoying um, some of the food in these uh, ice cream parlours and local establishments. So uh, one of the most fun things uh, going to the dance halls was getting ready um, to go for your night out. So people um, were very into their fashion at the time and sometimes people made their own dresses uh, and sometimes people were influenced by um, other fashions that they could see. Uh, this particular um, dress is made is a, is a replica made um, from a fabric and a, a pattern from the time. So uh, it was made from the a pattern in the Marks and Spencer um, archive. So it's typical of what people might have worn if they were going to make a dress. Um, sometimes people as well uh, maybe had hand-me-downs and, and adapted dresses to wear. Uh, when we were doing this project before, uh, one of the nicest memories um, from a lady was uh, that she kept her shoes, um, her dancing shoes, in a tin box at the end of her lane um, because she didn't want to get them dirty uh, walking up. So uh, sometimes people had shoes like these, um, which were known as galoshes, and these were overshoes to keep your um, dancing shoes clean. Uh, shoe fashion really changed at the time as well for men. So you can see um, these shoes, uh, which were winkle picker shoes, um, called that because they have a very pointy toe. Um, so these were from the sort of 60s and 70s as well. And people were influenced sometimes by the music they listened to. So when people were getting ready to, to go out to the dance halls, they would have used um, quite a lot of accessories as well. Um, one thing that was very important um, was hairstyles, which might have been influenced by um, singers or bands. So whether you were into rock and roll 
or maybe um, wanted to um, recreate the fashions of your favourite singer. So these are our replica items, but they would be items that were well used um, at the time. So hair rollers and hair curlers, um, which people would have used. Sometimes people would have kept them in overnight as well um, to get uh, more curls. So people would have had those um, for their hair. These are some stockings which again, these are original from uh, a Marks and Spencer um, archive. So that would have been something that women would have had um, as well. In terms of makeup, this is uh, powder from uh, the brand is Evening in Paris. So this would have been something that um, people used. So there were products that people used um, for their hair. So twink perms were quite well known. Um, you would have found these advertised in magazines and newspapers um, for curling hair. Also here you have um, brill cream for hair as well. And this is a little replica shaving brush which men would have used. Um, so we have lots of different accessories in the collection and really getting ready to go out for a night was something that was a lot of fun for people and uh, brought them a lot of joy. Of course, once you start at working, um, no matter what it would be, whether it was if you were a, an apprentice or a, in the building trade or a labourer or whatever it happened to be, or in the case of young ladies, maybe you were working in an office keeping books or something like that, or maybe a generation before that they were they were uh, young young girls would go into service. Mostly that was that was the, the the what most young girls did for their for their occupation, working in big houses and so on. But no matter what it was, whether you were a nurse or a doctor or a bricklayer, you had a few shillings in your pocket, didn't you? Of course, that was in the days when. Uh, you literally only had a few shillings in your pocket because as soon as you started working, you had to pay housekeep, didn't you? You had to put some money back into the house. You don't hear that talked about quite so much nowadays, but it was a big thing when I was young, certainly, and I'm, and I'm sure whenever, whenever you were young, you always had to pay something back into the home. But with a few shillings that you had, of course, probably top of your list, uh, top of your priorities was to maybe go to a local dance, or maybe not so local. I was talking to one gentleman recently who was telling me that he uh, regularly used to cycle from, from Larne to places like Cushion Doll, which is 26 miles away, just to go to a dance. I can't help feeling that there must have been some pretty young girl at the end of that journey. And of course, you had to cycle the 26 miles back again. And in those, those, uh, those uh, rural areas, Cayley dancing up until even the 1950s and 60s still prevailed as the, as, the, as the predominant style of dancing, the predominant kind of dance that people went to uh, out, out in the country areas. It wasn't until uh, the 1950s and 60s, of course, that ballroom dancing kind of took off. And that was more, more in, the, in the towns, uh, of course. And all the hotels and, and there were, well, there were even dedicated dance halls, as, as I'm sure you know. But a lot of the hotels would have run dances on a Friday and a Saturday night. And I always love to look at the old posters when I can get my hands on them. And here's, I've got a couple in front of me here. I've got one from the King's Arms Hotel Ballroom. And uh, I, I'm guessing that this must be the sort of late 1950s. And it says, entrance from Point Street near the King's Arms Hotel, Friday the 12th of August, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. Now, I thought that that was very late for, for back in those days. Uh, I don't know what, what you think about that, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't get dances running on even in these times to 2 a.m. Generally, you might get nightclubs in Belfast and so on that go on to goodness knows what time, but usually... Nowadays, dancers are, are well over by that time. And uh, there, there's, a, there's another wee pit, bit on the poster here. It says, dances every Saturday night throughout the year from 8 p.m. to 12 midnight. So this must have been a special one that was on to 2 a.m. But here's, here's an odd thing. It says, admission, four shillings and sixpence for gentlemen. And for ladies, it was only three shillings and sixpence. That's an odd one. 
that I haven't really been able to get to the bottom of. Um, it could be that maybe, uh, as, as we know, disgracefully, uh, and, and it still happens in some places even to this day, ladies are not paid as much as gentlemen. Sure they're not. And they certainly weren't in those days. And so maybe it was felt that ladies didn't have as much money to spend as gentlemen did. Although I suspect, I suspect that it was also to encourage more ladies than gentlemen. The last thing you would want a dance if you were a hotel proprietor or if you ran a dance hall was to have more gentlemen than ladies. That would never work. And um, then this goes on to say that the, the music is by the Bob Strachan Orchestra. Now, I didn't know Bob Strachan myself, but I heard, I knew of him, and I, I, and I knew uh, his son, he was a great musician. And uh, it's, oh, it goes on to say that uh, it's, um, it's accompanied by the vocalist Margaret Ross. And that name, <clears throat> Ross, is synonymous with Island McGee, and him. I imagine that's where she came from because it says in brackets after the Bob Strachan Orchestra, late the Rinka Orchestra. So they must have been, they must have been a great orchestra to get a, get a mention in brackets there. Well, of course, in these days, uh, I, I don't know if it would still happen today, but certainly I can remember the first sort of dances that I would have went to. And you hear this countless times when people are talking about their dancing days, about the men all lined up on one side of the room and the ladies all lined up on the other side of the room. And it took a brave man, it took a brave man to walk across that no man's land uh, to the other side to ask, some young girl to get up and dance because the, the worst thing that could happen to you, of course, is that the young lady would say no and then you would have had to make that lonely walk back across no man's land to your own side and you can be sure that you would have got some ribbon if that had been the case. And uh, I've got another one here from the Flamingo and it's dated September 1968. And this, this is a great one. Wait till you hear this. It says, Would patrons please note that admission to the ballroom will be refused, and refused is in big capital letters. Refused to those wearing denim jeans and who are of untidy appearance or, or who are under the influence of of alcohol. Because of course in those days, in the 1950s and 60s, no alcohol was allowed whatsoever at these dances and I hear it all over the countryside. When you went to these Cayleys or ballroom dances or later even when the show bands started to come around, you got tea and buns and scones and biscuits, no alcohol. Now that doesn't mean that there was never any alcohol at these dances because of course some people had a wee stash outside or maybe had a wee bottle in their inside pocket. But generally speaking, you were not allowed any alcohol in these dances. And I've got one more here. That I've got one from the Abbey Hall in Ballyclare, which I hadn't heard of before. And it says that the, the dancing uh, is on Friday night, 5th of August, and it's the Des Gallagher and his band and that dancing is from 9 to 1 a.m. And admission to this one is 2 and 6, which is a lot cheaper than the King's Arms, which was 4 and 6 for a gentleman and 3 and 6 for a lady. I can only, I can only conclude that out in the countryside, once you, once you started to get out of the bigger towns, that the dance halls were a wee bit cheaper, which probably was the case. But there's one last thing here that says that at 12.30, half an hour before the, the dance is over, that the bell of the ball will be picked. My goodness, can you imagine that happening today? The bell of the ball. I'm sure some young ladies were delighted to be picked as the bell of the ball, but I don't think it would be very politically correct nowadays. Sure it wouldn't. Well, it's come a time, I'm afraid, I'm going to have to love and leave you. But before I go, I want to tell you uh, one wee story and it's about the, my first holiday ever in my life and uh, I wasn't very old, it was way back in uh, I suppose about 1969, something like that there 
And of course, I was so excited because I had never been on holiday before. I had never been on a boat. I had never been in a train. And I was going to do both these things. And so we went over on the boat from Larne to Stranraer and we got the train down through England. And we were heading away down to the, near the south of England where my sister lived. She had left home a few years before and she was working over in England. And my father took um, my mother and the rest of the younger siblings over to England to, to visit my sister. So it was very exciting as you can imagine. And in those days, the trains had a big long corridor up one side of the carriage and they had these separate compartments. You see them in all the films now. You know the ones I'm talking about. And they had a sliding door to get into the compartment and two seats facing each other. And on the window, they had a, a sliding sash up and down window. Well, in those days, my father smoked the pipe. He never had the pipe out of his mouth and there was no thought for secondary smoke, of course, in those days. And he was smoking away at his pipe in this compartment. Of course, I never slept a wink all night. And when it came dawn, I was looking out the window at four o'clock in the morning. And it was the first time I'd seen deer. It was the first time I'd seen a pheasant. And I was so excited. And my mother was dozing and some of the other ones were dozing. Some were awake and some were doing crossword puzzles. And then uh, later on in the morning, suddenly the door slid open. And in came this woman, an older woman, and she had a wee white dog, a wee terrier, like a wee West Highland white fluffy terrier in below her arm. And it was a yapping, barking, gurning wee dog. And my father was no lover of dogs at the best of time, but this dog uh, would have put years on you. It never stopped yapping and barking. Well, it was all right for the first minute or two, for the woman held on to the dog, but then the next thing, the dog was down on the floor, and then it jumped up in the seat, and it jumped over onto the other seat. And before very long, we were all covered in wee white hairs. And my father was sitting there in his good tweed suit. It was the only suit he had, and he only kept it for weddings, funerals, and on this occasion, going on holiday. And he didn't want his good suit covered in white hairs, but he just sat there, and he didn't say very much. And he was puffing away on his pipe. Well then, eventually the woman said to my father, excuse me, uh, you wouldn't mind putting your pipe out, would you? Well, my father never misbehaved himself. He just continued on puffing on his pipe and the uh, reefs of blue smoke coming out of him. Well, the woman got up and she pulled down that window, right down, and there was a gale of wind blowing in around the, 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 the uh, wee, wee uh, compartment. And we were all sitting, looking at my father, wondering what on earth he was going to do or say to this woman about this situation. Well, he didn't say anything. He just got up and he put the window back up again. Well, the woman remonstrated with him again about the pipe and she got up and she pulled the window down. And my father got up and he put the window up. And this went on back and forward a few times. And then suddenly the woman got up she pulled the window down she went reached over to my father she pulled the pipe out of his mouth and she threw that pipe out the window while we were sitting wide-eyed wondering what on earth was going to happen next what would my father do now well he sat for a minute or two like a volcano just ready to blow and we couldn't wait to see what would happen well the next thing he got up and he pulled down the window this time and he lifted that wee white dog and he fired that dog out the window as hard as he could. We couldn't believe our eyes. We couldn't believe what had just happened. Well, the woman went into hysterics. You brute, she said, look what you've done to my little dog. I'm going to report you to the station master when we get into crew. Well, before long, the train began to slow down and we pulled into the station. And my father never spoke the whole time. But we knew he would have something to say and my mother would have something to say once we got off, off that train and onto the platform. Well, the woman with a wee white dog, she was out the compartment, up the corridor and off the train like a hare, straight up the platform to the station master's office and we were getting our cart bags and our, and our luggage all sorted out on the platform and the next thing we could see the station master coming out and putting his cap on and the woman was pointing down the platform at us. 
and the station master straightened himself up and he came down the platform to have a word with my father. And as he was walking down the platform, I looked up the railway track. And what was coming running down the track towards us? But that wee white terrier running down in between the rails as hard as it could go. And what was hanging out at Smith? You think it was the pipe, don't you? No, it was its tongue. 